Warning, this podcast is a Korea Black production. This is a podcast for adults only. It is not a podcast for people who think podcast hosts should be emotional friends, spiritual advisors, surrogate parents, or role models for their children, grandchildren, or potential offspring. This podcast may contain all sorts of trigger warning type content such as graphic language, harsh judgments, and microaggressive behavior. If you are a sensitive person or reality challenged, or you only listen to podcasts that agree with your religious views, personal philosophy, ideology, or feelings about life in general, please do not listen to this podcast. All comments, compliments, and complaints should be sent to koreablack at koreablackproductions.com. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am back with Gianna. And today we are reviewing Old Boy, the, the original Old Boy from 2003, not that horrible Spike Lee version. So apparently, I guess over the last couple of months, Gianna has had a sort of come to Jesus moment where she decided to bless me with the privilege of reviewing Old Boy. And I say privilege until I start getting texts yesterday. So I'm just going to tell my Old Boy brethren that I don't know what Lady John is going to say, but we are old boy strong. And I'm telling you, I love this movie, no matter what she says. Because I'm just telling you, the text I got yesterday, I, I'm not really sure the love is mutual. But I will say this, to me, and I'm just speaking me, this story is like, and this is how Gianna should have looked at this story, an extremely dark fairy tale. It's about a story about pain and revenge, which leads to a step-by-step process of how you can break a man and watch him go insane. That's how she should have looked at it. But I'm pretty sure she didn't, and she probably looked at it like she does CSI or those serial killer things or whatever she watches. And I'm just saying again to my old boy brethren, I am sorry for about what she's about to say. Go ahead, John. Uh, first, I'm going to say the reason I decided to watch this is I'm tired of hearing you bitch at me all the time for not wanting to watch it. That's why. <laughs> and because I told you I was going to watch Handmaid's Tale and then I didn't have time. So I was like, well, <laughs> might as well just pick this goddamn movie that he won't shut up about. So I guess so... I was wrong on that. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. I should also say that, like, so I had never heard of this movie before you told me about it, right? Mm-hmm. But I was... uh walking with a friend of mine yesterday and we were talking and he was a film major right he has a master's in film right and for a while about say about eight years ago he taught film classes at the college uh the community college here in town and he said he taught this movie so i was a little surprised to hear that and i asked him what the whole focus was and he said it was because korean cinema at that time was not known and that this was one of the greatest korean movies that had come out at that time exactly true so there you go. So I learned something too. <laughs> but I told you that. I know, but I'm surprised that you like that this would be taught in a in a I guess college class is fine, but it's still a pretty uh interesting movie. <laughs> it it wasn't it, it was groundbreaking for several reasons, but it won the Cannes Films Festival. I mean, oh, it, yeah. you know how hard that is to do? Yeah. And it, it won the festival. So, yeah. and it influenced a whole bunch of filmmakers because no one had ever seen a story like this before. And this yeah. at, the, at the point this was made, uh, the director's name is Park Chan-wook. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. He had, this was the second in the Vengeance trilogy. So this was his highest budgeted movie that he'd ever done. Uh, actually, just side note, my favorite of the Vengeance trilogy is the first one. It's called Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. And then the third one's called Lady Vengeance. But this one is the one that kind of broke him into international success and stardom. But I still think the first one was better. 
But it, I had never seen a movie like this before. I, but we wouldn't in America, especially back in 2003, because this is even before Game of Thrones when incest was in, introduced to the world and people just slowly got used to it. This was before that. This was 2003. Yeah. People were uncomfortable even talking about incest, let alone watching a movie about it. And again, the story is not about incest. It just happens to end up that way. There's a difference, you know? And Because I, I, there's a friend of mine, I, I saw him at the uh, CES about a year ago, and he was saying, I was, tell, I, I was trying to talk about Game of Thrones, and he says, I won't watch the incest show. And I said, it's not about incest. He goes, but it has incest in it. And I said, yeah, but then it's an incest show. And I was like, oh my God. So if, if you melt it down to that, because the only reason I bring this up is because when I first said this to Gianna, she got all disgusted and then started, well, no, no, this is what she did. She went and read the reviews, which she shouldn't have done, because in the reviews, they put the spoilers. The first thing that jumps out to her is incest. First thing. However, she seems to have forgotten that her favorite show on the planet is Game of Thrones. For some reason, you're okay with medieval incest. <laughs> I'm not okay <laughs> with it, but I just, you know, it's just the history of the Targaryens, so I knew that it was coming. Um, mm. Okay. Yeah, and this, I don't know, like, I just am not used to Korean cinema, and I was texting you about this last night, about how campy it is, but you're right, like, I watch Squid Game, and there's a lot of parts of Squid Games that are very, that campiness as well. And Parasite. And Parasite, you're right. Because and you talked me like, into watching Parasite. I, did, I didn't yeah. come to you, you talked me into it. And that's, well, Parasite I like more because there's a really great twist right in the middle that kind of game, like, the whole movie kind of changes in the middle. Right. Um, and that's what I liked about it again. And you're right. I shouldn't have read about this movie before I watched it, but that's my own fault. Yep. Um, but I went into Parasite Blind. It was a movie that I just put on in the plane one day and watched it. So I had no clue. Like, you, and that's a great movie where you think one thing's going to happen and then it just totally like goes sideways. So that's yeah. why I, I thought it was interesting. But you're absolutely right. There were some very uh, over the top campy moments <laughs> of that movie as well. Yeah, because during the Parasite review, I had said, if you ever do watch Old Boy, and this is before we even knew about Squid Game, you will see same filmmaking techniques that they do, Koreans. Mm -hmm. and the Japanese to a certain extent, but the Koreans, I don't know if it's a mimicking thing or they're taught it that way, or they just, they watch each other all the time and they just kind of figure out that's the way you're supposed to make films. But they do a lot of over the top stuff. And to Koreans, it's not over the top. It's over the top to Americans. And you see this a little bit in some French films too. But it's different than how Americans do, where everything is supposed to be done in a realistic way. Mm -hmm. it, and like I was telling you on, in text last night, it's not about being realistic. It's just about conveying certain thoughts and emotions. That's all that matters. Whether it's over the top or not doesn't make any difference. It's just whether you get the sentiment behind what you're watching. Yeah. But you're kind of analytical, so you need to have them both in sync. And see, that's where I think the problem runs in with you. <laughs> you know plus you don't have a you don't watch a lot of asian cinema either so you're not really used to it yeah you get it in little bits and chunks of it but i i i, I was submerged into it for a while several years ago i don't watch as much as i used to and plus i also watch a lot of uh, or used to watch a lot of anime they do the same thing in anime there's yeah. over top moments especially when it's a lot of anime is based around teenage boys and they do this really annoying thing that bothers the hell out of most american men where the boys are always so uncomfortable and nervous around girls, mm -hmm. always. It's just really stupid and annoying. But I guess in Japan and Korea, that's a thing, I guess, I don't know. But I didn't think it would bother you in this film because you like Parasite. Yeah, and it wasn't a lot of it. It was just, there was a couple parts that were a little ridiculous. <laughs> um, and we'll get there, but, uh, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. This is a revenge film, first and foremost, right? And yes. it's- uh the incest thing is just a very small part at the end which again i ruined for myself so it wouldn't have even been part of the movie really till the end had i just watched it cold yep you wouldn't even have seen it coming so the film starts in 1988 with oh day uh who's arrested for drunkenness and you kind of get this sense that he's a kind of a piece of shit right like not the first time he's been arrested he misses zada's birthday because he's carrying a little stuffed animal with him so he goes to the phone, or uh, his friend Joe Juan, is that how you say it? I'm going to be terrible at these names. <laughs> I apologize. So I was just referring to Odesu as just Desu. Desu? That's how, yeah, okay. most of them were just doing that. Yeah. And then uh, I, I think I called the other guy Juan. Uh, okay. 
because he had two O's in there. So, but I don't know how you pronounce it. You need it. notes for this movie? I thought you've seen it so many times that you could recite it by heart. Because th- <laughs> this is an official record. And I want my official thoughts put in the official record yeah. so all my brethren will know how I feel. <laughs> so anyways, after his friend uh, picks him up from the police station, he goes to make a phone call in a booth and is approached by, or is, a guy comes up on him and kidnaps him, basically. Yeah. And when he wakes up, he's in a, uh, well, we first see him, like, uh, peeking through this little pet door, or, like a mail slot or something where the food is pushed under. And he's just yelling about, let him out. Where is he? What is he doing here? And then it shows that he's in this, like, it's like a recreated hotel room, right? Well, it's a building. It's like Yeah, a, so it's a building with, like, a, it's like a prison. Studio, studio apartments in it. Yeah, or I guess, yeah, I guess it's studio. Yeah. So it's like apartments that are turned into jail, jail cells, basically. Right. Uh, and they've re- decorated it, or it's created, like, you know, there's a bathroom and there's a living room and a TV and... You know, when I was watching this, I was thinking of you, like, is this your perfect life where you're just locked up alone with no people and a television? Like, this is <laughs> how I picture, like, your perfect life. <laughs> well, no, the perfect life would not be in a, any city. Yeah. You know, I'd have to be away from the people. I I, I I need a nice home, more than one room, by the way, but I don't want to be in the city. That's why even Las Vegas, I always live on the outskirts. Because I can't be near all the noise and especially those goddamn tourists. Like, I just can't do it. <laughs> um, but as he... So we start to get kind of a, a montage of his life in this hotel room. And they, he, But it opens with him saying, had he known he was going to be there for 15 years, would it have made it easier or harder? And I thought that was a super interesting question, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, do you... Is it having a known time, is that easier to get to than just not having any clue when you're going to be released? So I thought about that too. And at first I said, I wouldn't want to know, but then I changed my mind. I would, because at least I have a target. Yeah. I think just not knowing would drive you crazy. Exactly. And I'm just like, no, I I just need to know. Because how do you know you're ever getting out if you don't know? Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, you have no idea how long you're going to be there, right? So it's... But it slowly drives him insane. Right. You know, like, like, oh, man, the scene that really bugged me was when the ant is crawling under his arm and then comes out of it. <laughs> comes oh. out of it. <laughs> oh, it's so weird. And ants in this movie is a thing, too, which is kind of a weird yeah. uh, choice of, some, you know, like a... Uh, and I, I don't know if that's a Korean thing with the ants or they yeah. just made it up for the movie. I don't know. About yeah. the whole loneliness thing. I, I yeah. don't know. I never heard of it before until I saw this movie. So we also see that he's... As on watching TV, he learns that he's been his wife was murdered and that he was framed as the prime suspect, and that everyone thinks that he just skipped town. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but they never actually reveal if who killed his wife, right? We just no. assume that we it was part it was... of the plot, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, because I was kind of that kind of bugged me. I was like, wait, did like, I don't, I don't get that part. <laughs> well, yeah, they. I mean, again, this is the kind of stories that I like where they don't tell you everything. Yeah, and in our, in American audiences, they would say that's a plot hole, but yeah. to them, it's not necessary to the story. The story yeah. is he was just set up for the murder. Doesn't matter who really did it. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering because I thought there might be a reveal of like he actually really did it or something. I don't know. I just was it, thought there might be some other piece to that, but I guess I didn't realize that's just kind of backstory. Yeah. That wasn't that's not important to the story. It's I mean it is, but it isn't right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, so we see him just watching TV and. And learning how to shadow box. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is, um, and he starts tattooing the years, right? Of, or like, he starts kind of tattooing numbers on him or um, slash well, the marks lines, for every the slash year. Marks, yeah. yeah. And uh, at one point, he gets so crazy that he attempts suicide. But, oh, I should also say, sorry, they, they there's a thing that they release gas into the room and he hears a song and it causes him to pass out. And that's when the people who are holding him captive come in and like shave him and cut his hair and, you know, clean up or whatever. And so when he slashes his wrist, they also come in and make sure that he's still alive and can continue to live in his own misery. <laughs> um, just can I say one thing? Yeah. The, the way this film started, because you kind of skipped over that, uh, it starts in the present and we're reliving oh, how, yeah, how sorry, we got yeah. into this. I only bring it up because I thought it was funny. So in the beginning of the movie, 
Daisu is holding this guy. He's on the top of a building holding another man by a necktie. The guy is leaning off the side of a building because he wants to try to kill himself, and Daisu won't let him die because he wants to tell him his story. I bring it up because the guy who was hanging off the side of the building is holding this little white puppy dog. So he was, and I, I just, I, as soon as I saw that dog, I was, I've never seen Gianna's dogs, but I, I kept gonna, thinking. Look, I was going to get there because it goes back to that part of the story when he wakes up. So yeah, yeah. I, have, I have thoughts. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. Then I will save this because I couldn't help but wonder what she thought about this. <laughs> yeah, my thought was, does he really have to take the dog with him? Of like, course. Come on. The man's going to kill himself, and you're worried about the dog. This adorable little dog. Like, why would you do that to this poor, innocent little dog? <laughs> Just let the dog live, man. <laughs> Give it a fighting chance. Just let her loose, or him it, loose. And... It's going to be in heaven with him. To be fair, though, when he falls, the dog... Oh, we'll get there in a second. But anyways... <laughs> um... <laughs> So yeah, we also see that uh, Daisu is trying to dig a hole in the wall to get out. And he's pondering, oh, like, what floor am I on? Well, you know, if, will it be 53 stories up if I have to jump out of this? And, yeah. you know, all that stuff. But And he's learning, he's drawn a person on the wall that he, like, pretends to fight all the time. And, you know, he's just slowly going, I don't know, trying to keep his 15 years in there from going completely insane because he doesn't have a lot of stuff i mean he has tv and shadow boxing yeah that's it that's his whole life basically and then mm -hmm. oh when they feed him yeah you know oh and the guards never talk to him they they slide food under a slot in the door and they never speak to him no matter what he says to them and they feed him the same thing every day dumplings, dumplings. which that would probably fucking drive me insane itself <laughs> eating the same exact thing every single day every I day mean, that might be what breaks me right there actually. <laughs> so. well i don't know i i i i'm wondering how long it would take before you go nuts because you do all that analyzing stuff and you get so deep in your head, yeah. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm wondering, would you make a list of all your enemies and think one of them did this to you? Well, I say that's what he's doing too, right? In the yeah. in the jail cell, is he's trying to figure out who would hate him enough to do it. Mm -hmm. And he makes an interesting comment too that he's like, "I thought I lived a decent life, but when I actually think about it, there's a lot of people who could have done this to me." <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So it just proves that yeah, you could be going along thinking that you're a decent person, but if you actually sit down and think about it. You can think about how many people have, uh, you know, a, a, a disagreement with you or have a, a vendetta you know, against a vendetta, you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also about perspective. You might not, you might not have thought you slighted somebody, but yeah. that's how they took it. Yeah. You can't take, you can't control how someone interprets how you reacted or how you did something to them. You know, yeah. that's, that's an individual thing. So that's something also that's outside of his control. And that's probably stuff he was trying to figure out what did he do that he could have done to someone that he misinterpreted, that he he did wrong, did them wrong, but he didn't think he did anything at all. Because mm -hmm. he's got nothing but time on his hands. Yeah. It's almost like during the COVID days where everybody was stuck in their homes and just basically inside their head all day. Yeah. You know, just getting on each other's nerves and their own damn nerves. Because mm -hmm. they had nothing, not, nothing but time. Yeah, absolutely. So right as he's he's talking about how he thinks he has a month before he could his escape tunnel is finished, we see the gas turn on and knocks him out. And we see that he is uh, being hypnotized. They bring a woman in that's hypnotizing him. But we don't know yet what exactly she's hypnotizing him to do. And then so this is the part it gets to when he wakes up, which is this is kind of crazy. He's in the he's in a suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> like he wakes up in a suitcase on a rooftop in like a rooftop garden. It's like grassy. Um, yeah. Well, originally though, in his mind, he's in a grassy field. Yeah. And then it changes into what it really is, which is a a, a grass on top. They have, some of this is in, they have this in New York. I don't know if LA does this, but New York has this where they have gardens on the top of a rooftop or grass there. And so that's what they're doing. I guess Korea does it too, because that's what they did. Yeah, when um, I was in Japan, they had a bunch of them as well. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, so. But yeah, this is where he encounters the businessman with the dog who is talking about how he's going to die <laughs> or kill himself. And he asked the question, uh, shoot, I didn't write down the exact quote. I'm a, I'm a beast, but do I deserve to die? Is that what it is? Even though I'm a beast, 
do I deserve to die or do I have a right to live? I can't remember which way it went. But again, he's got this sweet little dog in his arm. It's like, just like, give the dog a chance, man. Only worried about the dog. Yeah, I really don't care about the person. It's the dog. Unbelievable. Clearly, this man is in mental distress. And the dog looked fine. <laughs> <laughs> the, dog, the dog looked, he didn't look distressed. He wasn't ye crying or yelping or anything. He's with his buddy. And they're about to take a little trip. <laughs> anyway, so Desu convinces the guy that he needs to tell his story and he sits there and tells the story and then when the guy says okay now my story Desu just gets up and leaves him there that's right <laughs> like it wasn't about it's you man still, still a selfish prick by the way <laughs> um, he could have nobody but himself right again 15 years in a room yeah well I mean you know because at first when he first saw the guy he started smelling him and touching him because he didn't know if he was real yeah you know that's so right. He's, yeah. he's kind of <laughs> being born into the world again, yeah. you know. So he's just like that. All right, he's had this stimulation. Now it's time to move on. It's like the girl, the woman in the elevator, he freaked out. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So he gets in the elevator, and not only is he freaked out by the woman, but I feel like he's also freaked out by being in an elevator, right? That's what I got. Oh no, no, no! I think you missed something in that elevator scene. What? He had an orgasm. Oh, I didn't even get that. Because he just hadn't seen a woman in 15 years. Oh, geez. That's And what he was doing was he was holding himself in the corner so he wouldn't attack her. Ah, and, okay. And, he, and, and that's why he, he was, you heard, when the elevator goes down, you hear him yelling. That yeah. was ecstasy. And then when they're coming out of the door, she's complaining to that, I guess it was the doorman, about what this guy did until the, the rooftop jumper crashes into the car. <laughs> All right, yeah, I totally misinterpreted that scene. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I should say, this whole movie is very sexualized, because I forgot to say, even in the room, they show a they show a scene of him jerking off to the television. Yeah, so. yeah, to a, a, was it Dancers or something? Yeah, I think, I think it was like a dance recital. Yeah, they didn't even give him any porn. No. All he had was regular TV. That's it. For 15 so years. No titties, man, for 15 years. Nothing. That's just tough. his imagination, you That's know? Tough. Yeah. But I was going to say, when the guy crashes out of the car, if you watch the scene, he's got the dog clutched to his chest. And then when he hits the car, he like lets his hand go. So maybe the dog lived. You know, I have hope. I saw that too. I rewounded <laughs> it because I wanted to see how, if they, if they were going to let him, the dog hit first and he's holding his arm up and the dog, the, well, the stuffed dog, I guess is what that yeah. was, is bouncing. And I, maybe the dog lived. Maybe it lived. I feel like you... he, he cushioned the dog. So oh I think my we're good. God. That, your, your whole old boy experience comes down to whether the dog yeah. lived. Do you know there's a website that says it's called Does the Dog Die? Oh, I learned I about, about this. <laughs> no, no, no. It's done because people want to know before they go into a movie, if there's a dog in the trailer stuff, does the dog live or die? And they decide based on the answer whether they'll go see the movie or not. Interesting. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know you people were that mentally disturbed with these silly ass animals <laughs> that, that you need someone to spoil the movie. Just about the dog. Nothing else. Just, we just need to know before you can mentally and emotionally take the movie. It's weird. Yeah, that's true. Uh, speaking of which. <laughs> can you hear him? Sorry. Does your dog look, look like that dog? Or do your dogs? Oh, uh, one of them kind of does. That's what I thought. I'd never seen, maybe I saw it in a picture, but I thought that dog, I don't know if it was white, but I thought you had a dog that looked like that dog. Yeah, I have a grayish white uh, poodle mix that probably looks similar to that dog. Mm. That was, I think, like a, uh, that might have been a poodle mix. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that was. <laughs> anyway, so Desu encounters a group of thugs and he... Does he steal the cigarette? Right, he steals the cigarette out of the guy's mouth. Yeah, he walks up and takes it because he hadn't smoked a cigarette in 15 years. Yeah. And these dudes obviously want to fight him. And so he's pondering about whether all those years of fighting, fake fighting would make him a better fighter. And this is where I got a little annoyed because it's like, would it really, would it really, would okay. it really enable him to beat the shit out of four dudes? Five. Five, but sorry. Here's the thing. So you have to remember... So like I said, this is like a dark fairy tale, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also sort of like a comic book because it was based on a comic book. So this is sort of like a superhero uh, story, essentially. It, it, it's about a man who through training and obsession becomes more than a normal man, which is why he can take these five guys 
and not to mention the scene that happens later. Yeah. He he has evolved himself into what basically would be sort of like what Daredevil did when he became a better fighter or what Batman did when Batman became a better. He just trained, trained and trained and trained uh, through various masters, though, those two had. But in this case, he trained in his own mind, in his own little apartment to become a better fighter because he had nothing else to do. He just didn't want to become all fat and die of a heart attack. Yeah. But I mean you're training you're using moves and you're you're trying to anticipate what people are going to do it's basically the same thing you know you're they're just setting self-training him up yourself. as the hero of this story is what right you're doing. and you have to think of it as like a superhero story because remember it was based on a comic book although mm-hmm. in the comic the ending is completely different the, the the director of this movie wrote this ending specifically for this story so it's a whole different thing in the comic book okay and they rewrote it for the newer old boy too, right? That's a different yeah. ending as well. I've blocked out a lot of that horrible movie, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I will never watch that movie again. It was so bad. It was yeah. horrible. So he somehow takes on five dudes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then he finds himself in front of a sushi restaurant staring at like the tanks with the fish in them. Mm-hmm. And it's I think it was kind of funny because he goes, what's that smell? And it's some drunk has wandered up next to him. Yeah. And uh, just hands him a wallet full of cash and a cell phone. An old school cell phone. We should say this movie was in 2003. Oh, so flip phone. Old, old school flip phone. Now stop um, right there. If yeah. you remember, in Squid Games, the same thing happens. I forget the character's, the main character's name. When he's at the near the end of the series, this old lady walks up with flowers and gives him a note. That's right. You see? they. Yeah. I mean, they kind of imitate, mimic each other. And yeah. so that's what I'm saying. That's why I was asking you before if you're gonna see you're gonna see certain tropes that are they're they're it's in Japanese stuff too, but they they like to mimic each other, and it's it it to them it makes sense to do this kind of stuff because fate has a lot to do with their storytelling too. Yeah, it's not like science based stuff. It's just the hand the invisible hand of fate is putting you here so this person can contact you to push the plot forward. That's mm-hmm. that's the big thing in their storytelling. Yeah. So Daisu goes inside this restaurant and he makes an interesting request. He meets this young, pretty girl that's the chef there. But this was interesting too, and I don't know if this is real. He makes a comment to her that women don't aren't normally sushi chefs because their hands are too warm. And I thought I, female hands were always considered to be colder. No, I think you guys are always cold, but your hands are generally warm. My you hands say are always men's are... freezing. Yeah, so yeah. Well, uh, I, maybe generally... I'm the anomaly. <laughs> Well, it could be because she says she's a different breed because her hands are cold yeah. later in that scene. But generally, you guys get colder easier than men do. Yeah. Um. But yeah, usually y'all y'all are warm, you know, or maybe yeah. you're just trying to compensate your body is because you, you you get cold easier. So that means your your body has to work harder to keep you warm. I wonder if that's a real reason because thinking about it, I go out and eat a lot of sushi and I very rarely see women as sushi chefs. So I wonder... If it's That's just true. because it's a male dominated thing or if because there's some truth to this and I should go back and look it up because I, uh, I I'm it's pretty sure it's male dominated, but I don't yeah. know if there's truth to that part of it. Yeah. Uh, so this young sushi chef is named Mido and he asked her to bring him something alive to eat. And I this scene is ridiculous. <laughs> it's alive. And when I read that this isn't even CGI, he actually That's eats real. a live octopus. That's right. And I guess this is something they do in Korea, but holy shit. Like, <laughs> I don't think I could do that. Well, she offered to cut it up for him. Yeah. He said no. Uh, he he just likes takes it a fresh. Big, he just takes a big chunk right out of the head of the octopus. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to write a scene for Gianna where she has to eat a live puppy. And so we can, obviously can't do it in this country, but but I want to see yeah, if her... Yeah, happening. <laughs> <laughs> you have to CGI that shit. <laughs> Where's your dedication? Where's your method acting? <laughs> You're ridiculous. So you couldn't even have done that? You eat seafood? Yeah, but not alive. Eating something that's alive is just weird. It's just the like, first couple crunches that would bother yeah, you. Yeah, but I think it's the concept of the, like, it's just, it's too much. I can't do it. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Isn't sushi raw fish, though? Yeah, but it's not alive. You don't know like, when it was killed. That's true. I mean, there are some restaurants in Japan and stuff that will pull a fish out and like carve it right there. So technically that's right. the fish is dead, but it's like like literally that fresh. Right. So I guess, but I don't know. It's too weird to me. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a crazy scene. Um, so then his phone rings and he answers it and it's his captor. Yeah. Desu freaks out and Mido reaches over and grabs his hand and because obviously he hasn't been touched by a female in a long time, he just collapses or faints. And when he wakes up, he's in Mido's apartment, which again, I mean, I know they talk about why later, but this was to me like, what the fuck? Really? You just met this dude and you're going to take him back to your apartment? Like... She has a good heart. That's just weird. I mean... <laughs> you don't even know this dude. She... Wait, wait. She... The man is obviously... He's distraught. He needs help. But she's also... She's, this was a part that I didn't understand either. She's reading his journals from that he kept when he was in captivity. Yeah. Where, where did those come from? No, no, no. They were in the suitcase. Yeah, but did he have the suitcase with him? I didn't. Oh no! Seen. Well, that I didn't know. I, yeah. I, I mean, like I that's guess... where I was confused. Is like when he was walking around and beating the shit out of people, he didn't have a suitcase with him. He wasn't carrying anything like a backpack. I so mean, I guess it's kind of like how, a... did, how did all those things get with him? That's well, what okay, so there was about six or seven of those. I, uh, I mean. I guess what you could say is he stuffed them in the in his waistband of his uh, pants, and the coat was hiding them, so you couldn't see them. All right, maybe. We'll I mean, that's that. that's that's right. the only thing you could really say. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they kind of, but yeah, they talk, and and she's interested in if this really happened to him, and she basically offers to help him find his daughter. So they go to the shop. Oh, wow. What? You missed I I thought you were gonna jump on something there. What did I what did I miss there? Okay, so Oh he... the story says you're right, I totally missed it. Uh yes, so she is tell she tells him that uh the bathroom doesn't door doesn't lock, so don't get any funny ideas. <laughs> and then as soon as she sits on the toilet, he comes in there and I guess tries to rape her. Like he, that's what it seems like. He okay, yeah, because he tried to pull her it wasn't just a kiss. Yeah. He tried to pull her panties off. And she fights him off and bonks him on the head. But again, but, why would you let someone stay in your goddamn house after they try to rape you? Like, okay. Now, now, I, I honestly, when I was rewatching this, I totally forgot about this. Um, so I understand <laughs> that scene makes no sense. Makes no sense. <laughs> it makes literally no sense. You bring a stranger home and then you warn him not to rape me in the bathroom. And that's what he tries to do. And you still let him stay with yeah. you, even though he attempted to rape you. Yeah. There's, there is no other way around that. And the only defense he would have is, well, I haven't seen a woman in 15 years and I just couldn't control myself. And I feel like that's what he tells her and she's okay with it, which is weird. But yes, that scene made no sense. You didn't need that scene. No, you I didn't. feel like you didn't need that. You, it like, it, it could have went from the journals to him or her helping him find his daughter. Yeah. I, why uh, there? Maybe uh, that's why I did that. Maybe I just blacked it out because it was so stupid. <laughs> well, there's also, if I remember right, there's a similar scene to that in Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance as well. I, I, so I don't know if this is a, the director's thing. He likes to just put these little quirky things in there. Oh, they're in Lady Vengeance too. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It might be his thing because I don't know if he wrote the scripts or yeah. he changed it and put the scene in there. I don't know. But yeah, when I when I saw that. I thought I was going to get 18 texts. So this is about a sexual assault superhero? Well, I was trying not to text you too much about the movie because I knew we were going to talk about it today. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess it's showing that he's like not, I don't know. I don't know what it's showing. But he's not a good guy. I yeah. mean, we, we, but we know that. We know yeah. that from the get-go. I mean, see, I know in like in America, I know generally when they say, uh, when you have a anti-hero, there are certain lines they won't cross with anti-heroes, except for the Punisher. Apparently he can kill anybody he wants to. But that sexual assault is one of those things that they don't really allow. Even though people have gone back now on old James Bond movies and saying that he kind of pressured women into having sex with him. Yeah. So I, I don't I disagree with that completely, but that's how it's looked at today in 2022. I mean he also slapped him around. So <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, are we are we gonna say that's not true? Like he did We kinda have around. to we have to take it in context of why he was doing it. Uh... He didn't just slap him because they didn't get him a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So anyway, she decides, I don't know why, to help him find his daughter. And <laughs> they find out, they like travel to the store where she pretends to be a reporter and is asking this woman and because uh, again, he's still a convicted or he's a uh man he's at large. Wanted. He's for, a fugitive. Yeah, wanted man for killing his wife. Yeah, it's on all so the news. They find stations. out from this lady that the daughter was adopted to a couple in Sweden, right? Sweden or Switzerland. Sweden. And uh that she was you know that they don't really know where she is anymore but she her name was changed to some like more swedish some vaughn something some swedish sounding name yeah and uh and that she's kind of disappeared off the radar now that he kind of feels like his daughter he's not like hit a dead end he also remembers that he ate the same dumplings every day for his whole life and that he could probably pick out those dumplings if he had them again <laughs> So they decide that they're going to eat at every Chinese restaurant in town. Just the to dumplings. try to find the dumplings. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually he finds it and he follows a delivery man back to this building, which it's floor seven and a half, which is weird to me because I didn't know half floor existed, but hey, whatever. <laughs> well, in uh, Korea, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because it's uh, like here we don't do the, uh, well, a lot of places don't do the 13th floor. It's yeah, bad and luck. I guess in Europe the first floor is actually zero, not one. So, and okay. I think it might be that way in Asian countries as well. There you go. Uh, but yeah, so he finds this, like you said, it's like a hotel or a, a apartment complex that was created into a private prison. Right. And he finds out that it's run by this just corporation that you pay them enough money and they'll keep someone captive for however long you want them to be kept captive. Yeah, it's like a guy. The person who owns this building has basically turned it into a prison. And there's probably, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 apartments in the entire building. And he's and he's got he's basically a gang boss. And he the guards are his soldiers. Yeah. And so they're the ones who patrol the hallways and make sure no one escapes or breaks in or what have you. But he has converted this happens in uh inner cities a lot when uh drug dealers take over apartment complexes. And then they sell drugs right out of the apartment complex. Yeah. Everybody living there knows they're selling dope out of there, but they can't do anything because they got so many uh, gang ga gangbangers running around, or they get killed or whatever. So it's the same concept. It's just they're using, they're doing kidnappings instead of drugs. Yeah. Um, and let's not forget that Desu has a hammer with him. <laughs> That's right. See, now that was a different kind of weapon. Usually, it'd be a bat. Yeah, you know? I mean a hammer's a good one. That's gonna that's gonna fuck somebody up pretty good. That's right. So he uh, he ends up killing. They showed at the beginning. There's this guy that basically sits in the hallway and monitors all the rooms, and Desu manages to get the one up on him and kill him. And then he gets to the gang boss guy, which I don't remember his name. I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, they don't say uh, it originally, but it's, his it, name right? it it is Mr. Park. Is Mr. His Park. Name. That's yeah. right. Okay, and. He wants to uh, interrogate him and figure out who was keeping him prisoner. So to do this, and I couldn't watch the scene. I just of couldn't do not. it. Of course He not. Uh, uses the hammer to extract the guy's teeth. Yep. Oh, God. Like. No anesthesia, by the way. Teeth stuff is my nightmare. Like, <laughs> oh my God. like I've never even had a cavity, dude. So, like, the, the like talk of, like, doing stuff to your teeth is, like. Wait, wait, wait. I thought out. I thought what bothered you more than anything is the bugs going inside your ear. Well, that, too. But, like, teeth stuff is, <laughs> is also, like, my nightmare. Like, any kind of drilling or anything in the in the mouth is, like, no, I'm good. So, so you never had a root canal or anything? No, I never even had a cavity. Although, mm. knock on wood, I think I might the next time I go. Um, mm. But, yeah, like, the just the, like, whole, you're not even, there's no anesthesia. No. It's not, like, a good extraction. It's, like, breaking your teeth out of your mouth. Like, oh, my God, like, oh, that just makes me well, so, ooh. I mean, we don't know if it wasn't a clean break. I mean, I don't think it would be with the fucking <laughs> hammer, the back of a hammer. Like, that is not a clean break, my friend. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, I just want to say, see, this is why I love Korean cinema. I love the grittiness. I love oh. that a dude goes gangster on another dude, and he ain't worried about nothing. It's like, you know what? This is sort of like Soprano type stuff. You know, I don't know. They didn't really do a lot of this. Usually they would just shoot you or something. But I like these kind of scenes. I just do. And I'm not talking about like horror scenes like Saw. 
I'm talking gangster scenes where one guy gangsters another guy and teeth go flying. I just oh. like that stuff, you know. Yeah, but so all we we find out that Mr. Park doesn't actually know, or he doesn't he's not tortured enough to reveal the identity of the actual person, but he does tell Desu that he was in prison for talking too much. Yeah. So that's where uh, that's now Desu clue. has a little bit of a clue. Yeah. As to. But he doesn't know What's what it means. On. He doesn't know what it means. He has he no get, idea what that means. I forget. Does he get the tapes here or does, is that later? Uh, Yeah, he finds the audio recordings. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. So there's <laughs> audio recordings of Mr. Park and this mysterious person's uh, conversations. Yeah, the reason that happens is because Mr. Park said he didn't know who he was, but he recorded his phone conversations with him. Yeah. And that's why he gave him the audio cassette re uh, recordings. So that's how he finds out, right? Because that's what it says on the tape is that he talks too much. Yeah. When Mr. Park asked the guy why, because he says how long, you know, we can imprison somebody for however long you want. The guy goes 15 years and he's like, wow, what did he do? And mm -hmm. he just said he talks too much. So. Yeah. So this is this scene. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, I love that he beats up like the first two dudes. And he's confronted by like another 20 guys. 20 guys. He knows whose blood type is AB or whatever. That's and, right. And like, because he's like, this guy, oh, Mr. Park, it is. It's lost a lot of blood. That's what he said. That's right. Because he's Mr. lost Park. a lot of blood from pulling his teeth out. And he's like, from, he's, from, he's from dental type. surgery. I was like, okay, well, he has a little bit of a heart that he's, you know, trying to get Mr. Park sick. There you go. Some redemption there. He's trying to show that he's, he's still a stand up guy. Yeah. Now, let me talk about this scene because. In a cinematography sense, this is an excellent scene. And it's pretty, like, it's pretty well, like, it's a fight scene. And, but again, like, him taking on 20 dudes with just a hammer. Just a hammer. Um, Is a little crazy. But or I guess. Wait, and his shadow boxing training. And his shadow boxing training. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's, I mean, I will give it this, though. It does play fairly realistic. Like, the way he, like hits one guy in the knee with a hammer and now that guy is limping and like right. i mean you know it's it's for okay. being as unrealistic as it is it had <laughs> a gritty real feel to it right i know you didn't so. watch the daredevil series no. but daredevil season two ripped this off where daredevil was going down a stairwell of a building and he's got to fight about the same number of guys and he's doing the same thing. They're coming at him. He's fighting them. They're punching him, uh, slapping him. He's headbutting them, throwing them, punching them, and all this. But he has a different kind of fighting style, though. But yeah. they kind of ripped that off from this. Because I'm telling you, this was one. Of, this scene is one of the reasons this movie blew up in 2003. Nobody yeah. was doing this. There's another movie called The Raid that came out about six years ago. And it's about uh, police breaking into a drug building. And it's about it's, it's a lot more fighting, but the uh, one cop has to do the same thing. He has to go all the way up to the top of the building to get the boss, and he's got to fight all these guys coming at him with different styles and all this kind of nonsense. And yeah. it it just basically goes to the fact that it's whether you are on board with it or not. Now you, I thought I thought you were gonna just say this is completely stupid, but see this is different than when we watched that Game of Thrones where they fought for an hour. This yeah. is just like. Well, I think it was like five minutes, you know, but the way it was shot, it's it's interesting to watch how they're coming at him and how he's fighting them, you know, yeah. and he takes a lot of hits, you yeah. know, he gets stabbed right in the middle of the back. That's right. Which I'm pretty sure would have <laughs> severed some kind of spinal cord thing, but you know, well, that's maybe, if it hits the spinal cord, it, it, it probably would have at least punctured his lung. But again, he's super Daisu. <laughs> so he, he's got adrenaline pumping. He, he can't be stopped. He's he's a man on a mission. That's the part you're forgetting. It's overcoming. And yeah. the invisible hand of fate is pushing him towards his enemy. That's yeah. what's pushing him the whole time. Yeah. And don't forget about the elevator scene. Oh, yeah. Then he kills, like, what, four dudes in the elevator? There's about seven, eight more in the elevator. He, yeah. he kills them. And he's fighting. I don't know how you fight in an elevator no. with seven, eight guys. But he did yeah. it because he's super Daisu. <laughs> and then he gets to the street and that's where he collapses. That's right. And he gets some guy that we get the first glimpse of who has captured, who has done this to him. Yeah. And uh, the guy puts him in a cab and tells him, you know, take him to this address, which is, I believe, uh, Mido's house, right? Yeah, it's, it's her apartment. apartment. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, now, I do want to say this, too, because later we find out that these two characters are supposed to be the same age. And is it just, does he look, does Daisu look so much older because of the 15 years he spent in its prison? <laughs> or, like, is this just ridiculous how much younger that his captor looks? I mean, well, the guy's it, supposed to be rich, right? So maybe he's just doing all the rich people stuff to stay young. I don't know. Yeah, but 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 if you remember, we do see a flashback of Daisu when he's young, though. Yeah. So he does look young. I mean... You know, yeah, you're I, right. you, if, if you're 40 something, you can shave off about 50. It's, it's, a, I'm not being sexist. It's a little harder with women, mm -hmm. but for men, you can shave off about 15 years by the way you cut their hair mm -hmm. and if they're clean shaven or not, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, that that's kind of what they were going for. They're saying in the present, he's about 40, 45. And it, when, when he was, when we see him when he's younger, at least when he's a younger man, he's about 25, and then they have a different actor playing him when he's a kid. Yeah. But I'm thinking they're about the same age. It's just one that the the bad guy of this whole film, he's just a good looking guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he, that's that's why he looks like that. He's just a really good looking dude. So. Wait, did I forget? Did she have the internet conversation with the guy before this scene? I can't remember. I think it was. Mido is like, and she does online chatting with somebody. This guy named Evergreen. Yeah. And the guy tells her to tell Desu or ask if Desu likes his bigger prison or something like that. Yeah. They also make some a reference to the Count of Monte Cristo yeah. as well. So this makes him a suspicious of Mido, right? Because right. he's like, wait, is this all a trap? So after this scene, he goes back to Mido's apartment. Uh, she helps get him back to, like, she patches him up and everything, and he wakes up next to her. But then he also is still suspicious of her, right? So he ties her to the bed and confronts her about if she's in on this or not. Yeah. He told her when he got out of prison or the apartment prison, he said, I made a vow to myself never to trust anybody ever again. Although the only person he can trust is her until he meets his friend again, uh, Juwan. But she's the only one who took him in, mm -hmm. fed him, repaired all his wounds, you know? Yeah. Didn't press charges on that attempted sexual assault. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've already talked to Joe Joe Hoon at this point too, right? Because yeah, he runs um, an internet cafe. He runs an internet cafe, so he's gone and re reached out to him, and they asked about to look into the Evergreen thing. So as he's holding Mado tied up or Mido and um, interrogating her, he gets a call from Jawan and says that gives him an address for this guy, mm -hmm. and he realizes it's right across the street. Yeah. So he runs out of the apartment and runs over to this other apartment. And we now meet this businessman face to face for the first time. Yeah, we'll just call him Evergreen. We don't have to use his real name. So we'll just stick with Evergreen. So Evergreen is a wealthy businessman and he's got a little sidekick too with him. Some martial artist sidekick dude. Yeah, that guy's name ended up being Mr. Han. Okay. Yeah, I never knew if they said it. I think I, or if they did, I missed it. But he was just like the bodyguard. Yeah, in the last third of the movie, they say they finally say this guy's name because I was writing in my notes the blonde bodyguard. Yeah, because they never. I don't, that's one thing with Korean and Japanese. For some reason, they don't make it an issue to establish a person's name yeah. until they feel like doing it. So you might go the whole movie not knowing yeah. what the what to call the person. But he still got his hammer with him, by the way. That's right. That made it out of the of the bar fight with him or the the hallway fight with him. Casey's okay, so got a Mario somebody. So. The bodyguard kind of subdues him at first, but then he gets to the businessman and he's threatening to kill him with the hammer. And the guy's like, well, if you do that, you're never going to know who I am and why I did this to you. Right. So now he's in a conundrum, right? Because what does he do? And so he's going to uh, like torture the guy. And the guy goes, oh, no, I have. He reveals that he has a scar on his chest. And he says that he has a pacemaker and that he asks the doctor to give him a remote, basically, to shut off his own heart. And if you torture him, he might get too excited and die right in front yeah. of you. Or he said, if you torture me, I'll just push the button and I'll kill myself and you'll never know. That's true. But, you know, when I was thinking about that, that problem he had, mm -hmm. if I know it's you, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't really care what the reason was. I think I've just gone crazy. 15 years? I don't know, man. I think I would need a reason. Yeah. But, but the reason was 15 years. Yeah. That, that's my new reason. I did, what the original reason was is lost now. I'm like, look, 15 years eating dumplings. <laughs> you know, nobody, I'm framed for murder and all this nonsense. I don't know if I would have cared anymore after yeah. that. 
I just would have, if once you told me who he was and why he's the one who put me in there, I think I would have just went at him. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's, yeah. Because even if he tells you the reason, how do you really know it's the truth? It's true. You see? So Evergreen tells him that if he has five days to try and figure out who he is and why he's doing this to him. July the 5th. Yeah, July the 5th. And if, if Desu figures it out, then uh, Evergreen will kill himself. But if not, he'll kill Mido and every woman that uh, Desu has ever cared about, loved. Yep. So now he's like, the, now the terms have been set, right? And he knows that he has to do something. So what Desu decides to do is just go grab, or, or then he goes, this is, yeah, he goes, uh, you better go check on her. You left her tied up and the door open. Me though, yeah. And so he gets back to the apartment and Mr. Park and his gang of thugs are there again. That's right. And Although Mr. Park's got his teeth replaced. He's got his teeth replaced. He's got, got some, some new nice front teeth. Yeah. That's right, baby. What gold, man. He'd be all gangsta, like you said. That's right. And uh, poor Mido's breasts are out because I don't know if they have assaulted her yet or they're intending to assault her. But uh, she's tied up and half naked. I'll Mido. tell you, Mido had a rough go in this film. Yeah. <laughs> she did not as much physically as as my man Desu did, but uh, everything about her role in this was just getting shit on and get shitting on, and yeah. you know the worst thing she could have ever done is saw Desu uh, at yeah. at any point in this movie. So yeah, and so they're there to get revenge and kill him, I guess, or at least take his teeth out again. Yeah, they so, wanted he wanted to take his teeth out, yeah. like he even gave him his dentist card. Yeah. The one to put the fronts in. <laughs> You're right. So yeah, he wasn't going to kill him. He was just going to return the favor. Right, uh, right. But yeah, so this is an interesting scene too because he goes to do it and then he like fakes him out the first time and basically says, whatever you're imagining is probably worse than how it actually feels or whatever. <laughs> and uh, which I don't know about that because I still think the teeth thing would hurt pretty fucking bad. <laughs> but anyway, so it's the, is it the bodyguard that shows up, right? Or somebody else with a suitcase full of cash yeah, Mr. Han shows Mr. up. Mr. Han with the suitcase. shows up, right? Yeah. And convinces Mr. Park to leave them alone. Yep. Although he hits him with a bat on the way out, though. Yeah. He, he hits Daisu with a bat because, I mean, you pulled my teeth out with a hammer, dude. So yeah. I, I should just kill you and take the money anyway and deal with uh, the mysterious evil dude later. But <laughs> he's like, no, nah, I'm a businessman. I'll just take yeah. this cash. But I'm going to hit you upside the head with this bat, though. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, Desu's next move is to uh, basically run away. So yeah. he packs up Mido and they rent a car and they take off. And then we go to a scene that we find out that Evergreen has is tracking them somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Because Mr. Han goes and reports to him. But let me talk about the penthouse or whatever you want to call this office that Evergreen lives in. There is a shower right in the middle of the whole, like of the floor of the building. That's right. It's a glass enclosed shower and he's got like other people working with him and the dude just showers and walks nude throughout the fucking place. Um, it's so weird. Now, Gianna, now I, I, I can't speak on this, but you beautiful type people, you guys like being all sexy and beautiful and you don't mind if you're beautiful to shower in front of people. Ugly people, fat people, we are self-conscious about that. But you beautiful type, Gianna, don't have any problem letting everybody see how beautiful you are. It doesn't bother you. And I think there's another thing to this. this is a, I guess I should probably mention this later. This goes to shame. He, he is against any form of shame because of what is revealed later in the storyline. So to him being naked, he could probably have sex in front of those people. And what are they going to do? They all work for him. Yeah. So it's not like they, they if, if they say anything, he'll fire them or he could kill them. I don't know. So he's not worried about whether you see his schlong waving in the wind. Right, <laughs> he I don't care. That. I thought the penthouse looked great, honestly. I will say the closet was pretty cool. It was like this box that like like mechanic, like it's on opens automation. Up. And it opens up or whatever yeah. to reveal all his clothes. I thought that was pretty cool. And he had water running throughout the apartment and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. it was really classy. Yeah, it was. All right. But I guess you need your private time for your shower. I, <laughs> I guess. just thought it was very strange, but okay, <laughs> and cold, man. You imagine getting out of the shower and it's that whole open floor. Like I feel like it would get chilly. <laughs> well, yeah, 
But I mean, he has he owns the whole building, so I'm sure the 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 heat's running yeah. pretty well. That's another thing again that like like you you you're fine with them never explaining, but they also never explain how this guy is so rich or like oh no no remember was... two one said the family was rich. When oh they were okay. Kids. He said that they didn't say how they got rich, but the oh, family was already rich okay. when they were children. That's right. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he's decided to use all of his money to torture uh, Desu, apparently. His lifelong uh, vengeance to get back at him for something he did. That's all he kept thinking about. It didn't even matter that he's rich and can buy anything on the planet. All he kept thinking about was getting Desu. So Evergreen also ponders to Mr. Han. Do you think that they're really in love at this point? Uh, Desu and Mido. Mido. Yeah. So they travel to a hotel room where they have a very intense sex scene. That's true. They do. Where she doesn't look like she's having much fun. I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. That's subjective. Hey, there's a part where she's <laughs> like, this hurts so much, but I'll take it for you. Right. And it's like, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, wait a minute. Is there not a song that ca is called Love Hurts? Ah, uh, okay, sure. Thank you. <laughs> and didn't she say, I might, res now, hold on, I don't know how oh, you interpret right. this. Oh, you're right, yeah, yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, she said, I might resist it first, but push on through. She took her fist and pushed it in the air. Yeah, she said, said, she said that after he tried to rape her, she said, next time... <laughs> When I'm ready, I'll sing this song. And even if I try to resist, it means I'm still ready and just go ahead and push on through. I was like, holy shit. Okay. I will admit that part, you kind of go off the reservation a little bit because <laughs> that didn't make any sense. I don't care what decade we're in. I just like, I, I don't know too many women. I know that some women and couples do role playing, but they aren't really a couple yet. Yeah. She's talking about future sex. <laughs> you know, she's got this all planned out of when they're going to have sex, even though he had just attempted to rape her. You're right. That's and in the song she sings. That's the cue that she's ready for whatever he's going to give her. See, this is what I thought was bugging the shit out of you. These little parts. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just weird. Like, it's just so strange. But then again, I don't know culturally how men and women right like i it's hard for me to judge when i don't know the set like the korean culture and like yeah because i know that in some cultures asian cultures women are uh second to men you know yeah. and they're they are in a role that's like more um whether they want submissive. to be or not yeah yeah so i don't know if being submissive is just part of the of how their culture is you know yeah she's given into what she expects the man to want yeah whether she wants to do it or not, or whether she enjoys it or not. Yeah. And 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 Gianna's right. She does say, I, I, I'm assuming the implication was that she was a virgin. That's what I was wondering too, but she never actually says it. Right. But my assumption being is how young she looks, that this might be her first time. He saw her first on a TV show. Yeah. She was a, she won best Japanese female sushi chef or some nonsense like that. Yeah. So I'm assuming by the point they actually meet, I'm what she's 20, probably yeah, or I guess 18 to 20 somewhere. Because remember, uh, she he's been she's been he's been gone 15 years, and I think she was about four or five, maybe three when he disappeared. So mm -hmm. she's got to be 18 to 20 at this point now. So yeah. yeah, they consummate their relationship in an extended sex scene. That's and, right. And uh, when they wake up, or no, this gets really creepy. So. Somehow, the Evergreen has rigged the room for the gas to go in and knock them out. Again, not really sure the logistics of this, but okay, cool. We'll go with it. And he goes in and he, like, caresses Mido. This is super creepy. He runs his finger along her unconscious body. Yeah, naked. It looks creepy. It's super creepy. They wake up the next morning and there's a purple box waiting for them. And inside it is the hand of Mr. Park yep. with his ring on it. With the ring on it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice manicured hand, by the way. Yeah. But now he's down six teeth and a hand. <laughs> but they realize they're being bugged, right? So they Somehow they're being traced. So That's true. Uh, Desu goes to, I guess, like some retailer with a note that just says, I'm bugged, please find it. And they find it in the heel of his dress shoe or his yeah. shoe that he wears. So that's how they were able to know where they were and get 
recordings of them. Yeah. So they're able to ditch the bug in the shoe. This is when they start uh, researching the past. Yeah. Now, Desu's teamed up with Juwan. And so they're research. They're doing internet research. And what's her name? Mido is reading off all the names that are tied to Evergreen. And she says the name Evergreen Old Boys. And both of those guys recognize that from their past. And they realize that it was part of a school they went to. Sang Nook High School. Yeah, together. And that that's what they called themselves was the Evergreen Old Boys. Class of 1979. Gianna wasn't here yet then. Now they realize that this is probably where they know this person from. Yeah. And so, yeah, Mido and Desu travel back to the high school. And they convince, I guess, the janitor is what it is to let them go through all the old yearbooks. Yeah, Mido starts flirting with them. She's just an interesting character. <laughs> uh, this show definitely does not pass the Bechdel test. By the oh, way. my God. Um, <laughs> anywho. So they find out that the name of this guy is Lee Wu Jin. And that he was a classmate of theirs. But it still doesn't click to Daisu why he would hate them. Right. But what they also realize is that there was a girl... In, like, the grade below them, right, I think is what it was, mm -hmm. that uh, her picture's not in the yearbook. There were rumors that she was slutty. Mm -hmm. And uh, she decided to take her own life. But this was, Daisu had moved to, was it the U.S.? Or no, uh, where was he moving to? Uh, Seoul. Because they were, Seoul. like, he in a smaller city. city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were moving, he was moving to Seoul, so he left the school after and, and didn't know about all this. And he was kind of a bad kid back in the day, so... Yeah. You know, he was always getting disciplined, and I get, he probably got kicked out of the school. But yeah. yeah, he was leaving the school to go to a different city. But while this is happening, he calls his buddy at the internet cafe, Juwan, and we see the captor, Evergreen, sitting across, listening to their conversation. And Desu asks about this girl, and Juwan is just like, uh, oh yeah, she was a total slut. She slept with everyone. And he starts saying all this stuff, and we see Evergreen break a CD-ROM, which doesn't exist anymore. Nope. Uh, and stab the guy to death. It was vicious, too. And then he takes the phone and goes, you did this, Stasu. It's your fault because you took the bug off of you that I had to come here. And now, how dare he talk about my sister this way? And that she was not a slut. And that she was not a slut. That's the first time we see... Uh, Mr. Evergreen break his cool. Yeah, loses the him. whole time yeah. he's cool. You can't rattle him until you mentioned yeah. his sister in a derogatory manner, and then he loses it. So this is where the reveal kind of ha like, like you said, it's kind of intercut with other stuff. But basically, the reveal happens is that when Desu was about to get kicked out of or his last day of school or whatever, and he runs into the sister, and he kind of gets a little flirty with her, right? And then she leaves. And we see that he's upstairs in his classroom, like writing basically by bitches on the, <laughs> on the chalkboard. <laughs> and he sees a young evergreen, like running through the school, which he decides to follow him, which again, I don't really know why he did this. Right. He just kind of, it didn't make any sense. I went to public education, unfortunately. And I used to see kids run out the window all the time. I yeah. never chased any of them. So I said, that's where it just didn't make sense to me is why would he even follow this kid? Like, it yeah. just didn't, and I don't know, it didn't make sense. But anyways, so we see the young Evergreen run into a room and Desu kind of sneaks up. There's like a window with a little like crack in it that he can look through. And we see that Evergreen and his sister are uh, a little friendlier than they should be. Yeah. And it's such a weird scene because like, they're flirty, and then she sits there, and he tries to take her underwear off, and then she says no. Mm -hmm. But then he, like, opens her top and starts sucking on her breast. It's such a fucking weird... It's weird. So this this wasn't a romantic scene? Uh, they're brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> Was not the love real? Look, I think we have discussed this on our previous incest based podcast <laughs> if you grow up together it just makes it fucking weirder <laughs> like i i could maybe understand like a stepbrother and stepsister who like later in life become related but like uh -huh. when you are like grow up together like right. that is just fucking weird and they like, are direct blood relation yeah I mean, they, there's not step anything they're not even cousins they are blood 
brother and sister. Yeah, dude, it's too much. So like... just a side note. So this is not a love story to you. No. In any respect, even what happens later. I mean, uh, I. Are you saying because love is the motivating factor for right. revenge? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is before the reveal is given, the two people we're talking about don't know the secret and yeah. they are falling in love with each other. Yeah. Does that not make it a love story? I mean, this is, I guess there's a component of a love story, but I would not call it a love story. Be, oh, oh, you won't call it a love story because of the incest component. No, I, w- I won't call the the uh, Evergreen and his sister is definitely not a love story, in my opinion, because that's just disgusting. <laughs> now, again, like I said, no, like the context of the other incest is not revealed to right. the main characters. They don't know. That's right. And I mean, we should just say it. he's fucking his daughter. Mido is his daughter. OK, we find that out later. <laughs> and that's the revenge. But again, how how do you like? He doesn't know who his daughter is. He didn't grow up with, they didn't grow up with each other knowing who they were. They're strangers, right? right? So yes, it's fucking creepy and weird, but how do you blame these two people when they don't, like that, the familial tie is not there. But the blood tie is there, but not the the actual bond between a father and daughter, right? But in Game of Thrones, what's Cersei's brother's name? Jaime. Jaime. Cersei and Jamie loved each other. Did they not? Again, grew up together. Grew up. But did they not love each other? I mean, yeah, I guess so. They died together in each other's arms, did they not? Yeah, that was a horrible choice. Yeah, but yes. I agree. I know you're still mad about that, but, but, but let's forget about that for a second. They died together because they loved each other. Did they not? Yeah. That does not negate the fact that that love was real just because they were brother and sister. <sighs> I guess, yeah, it's still gross. I get it, but it does not change the fact that the feelings of love were real and they had children. Yeah. All Cersei's children were Jamie's children. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> so, you know, that's all I'm saying. I've asked discussion to other women who've seen this movie. They will, Most of them will not call it a love story because of the incest. Mm-hmm. They refuse to say it all because of the incest. But if you took the incest component out, they would call it a love story. You're right. You're right. <laughs> or I should say you're not wrong. Let's go there. Ah, there we go. So I'm like half right. <laughs> Anyways, so we figure out the why. Yes. Um, why he's been. Oh, because then we also shows a scene that right before he leaves town, he tells the secret to Jay, Hu- Jay Juan, but also says, don't tell anyone. Right. Mm-hmm. But I guess he is stupid because he told his friend who has a big fucking mouth. So, That's right. Uh, his best friend, though. Yeah, his best. And friend. they were kids. You gotta remember, they they always tell each other stuff. They were like probably teenagers, right? Like fifteen or sixteen, I would say at the time. So you remember high school, right? Yeah. You couldn't say nothing to nobody without being repeated. That's true. Yeah. yeah, that's how it was back then. Yeah. So we see Daisu and Mido meet up with Mr. Park. Um who has a beautiful new building with all new cells. And he says, you know, my enemy of my enemy is my friend now. So he like tries to join, you know, and he shows Mido what it was like to the cells he had, the cell he lived in basically for 15 years. But then she goes, why did you bring me here? And it's because to keep her safe, he decides to have her locked up by Mr. Park. Yep. Which uh, maybe not the best idea on his part. It was not. Why would you go back to your torture, man? That's well. I mean, uh, clearly, there's a lot of bad relationship dynamics in this film. <laughs> you know, everybody does something to somebody, and they still trust people. And I don't know why. You know, uh, again, we can go back to Mido. Why would you let a man who sexually assault you stay in your apartment? The story should have ended right there with her. So we see Desu is now going to go confront Evergreen. Right. Yep. And he gets to the penthouse and he's trying to figure out the code in the um, elevator. Oh, they also figure out why it's July 5th, because that was the sister's birthday. So or the day. No, sorry. The day she no. killed herself. Yeah. The day she yeah, died. The day she killed herself. Yeah. So he gets to the penthouse and as he's trying to figure out the code, we see 
Evergreen and the bodyguard walk in with him <laughs> and basically escort him up to the penthouse. Now, I will say this. This is a move that I've seen in a lot of Asian cinema mm -hmm. where the guy is sitting there. And they also did this in like the James Bond thing, too. The guy's about to get to the, the main guy. And all of a sudden, out the blue, his arch enemy just walks into the room or walks into the elevator, gets on the bus and sits there and talks with them for a little bit. Yeah. They, they do this constantly. <laughs> I don't know why. It doesn't bother me, but I know if you're not used to it, you'll be like, that That kind of takes kind of some of the anticipation of the meeting away, yeah. you know? But I don't know. I'm, I'm used to it, so it doesn't bother me. They get up to the top floor, and uh, Evergreen says something like, uh, grab him or whatever. I, yeah. I can't remember. The, but he has men up there waiting. So, so Desu starts fighting and kills a couple of them, and he goes, I just want to talk. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah so this is the weird scene where he showers and then he walks out naked and then as he's getting dressed he's telling desu why he did a lot of this right is that his sister after he talked to his friend his friend went and told everyone and these rumors spread that his sister was a slut and then that she was pregnant mm -hmm. and then that's what really drove her insane is because whether it was real or imagined a phantom pregnancy, she started not having her period and gaining weight. Right. So she thought she was going to now have to live with the fact that she was having a incest baby. <laughs> incest baby. And Daisu <laughs> even says that. He's like, yeah, the burden of carrying your brother and your son at the same time. That's right. right? It's really, uh, really creepy. Yeah. It could be, it could end up being like a, a Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> so then he comes out of his closet with a laser pointer. And this is kind of a weird scene as well. Is when he like laser points to the box, right? The another purple box that's sitting there. Like basically guiding a dog to a to a toy or something. Yep. And, he, and Desu goes up there and he opens it. And this is where the big reveal happens is that it's a photo album. And it shows his daughter up until her age and now what she looks like, which is Mido. And he completely breaks down. He loses his damn mind. Because he, you know, they were banging for a little bit there. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine that would he acted the same way. Yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, he he's having a sexual relationship with his daughter that he did not know was his daughter. And he also realized he's been manipulated this entire time, the 15 years was horrible, but this part's worse. Yeah. You know, and it was all planned out by this man, Evergreen. Let me just go back a second, though. The camera work during the reveal <laughs> is so weird. It's like some weird zooms and cuts. Yeah. Like. Okay. So you also see this in uh, Quentin Tarantino stuff. Mm -hmm. He does this a lot. These weird zooms, um, to uh, especially in Kill Bill. You'll see this. Asians like doing this. It's not a thing that's done in American filmmaking that much, unless you're trying to be funny, like in comedies. Yeah. But in in serious Asian cinema, they they will do these zooms. Yeah. And it's just to intensify the facial expression of the actor. And it it, I mean, either it works for you, it doesn't. I mean, but it happens a lot, you know. So, and I figured that was what was buggy. I thought that's what you were talking about. That this movie's weird by the way it's shot. It's got a lot of shaky cam stuff, weird angle stuff, and you're more used to American filmmaking where it's all properly set and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And in this movie, it's kind of like haphazard. I was going to say, that was the only scene that really bugged me with the camera work. Like the rest <laughs> of it was just kind of like, okay, this is what it is. But yeah, that was just such a, it was so different from the rest of the movie, I felt like. Yeah. Because I think this, the exact scene is like, one person's in the foreground and one's in the background and the camera just does like a straight up like fast zoom on the face of one of them and you're just right. like what the that's so weird <laughs> so, it's a very strange camera work for that one yeah there's also some interesting music work too that you know in some of the stuff yeah i, was, I, I don't know the music didn't bother me i mean i don't know if you liked it or not because they like they'll They'll play the music and then people will be talking. They won't let you hear what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> you just hear the music playing. But the way this movie's constructed, the music is a character. It's just an unseen I was trying character. to think, there was, what was this, what kept happening that they would play the like orchestra music? Oh, I can't remember what it was. 
Uh, I don't know. I caught that a couple. It was the same piece of music they played a couple times. It was like violins. Yeah, like I can't remember. Uh, oh, well, I know they. It's, it's the music from that Chef's Table show, so that's why I recognized it. Oh, I didn't. But I know can't it was remember. From. I can't remember what like there was a couple different scenes they played it in. And I can't remember what the, like what set it off. Because um, they were playing music during the the big fight scene in the hallway too. Yeah. Um, to make it bigger and stuff like that and more dramatized. Yeah. And uh, there is music when whenever Evergreen's talking to like his people. Yeah. And, and I guess that's to make him more grandiose. You know, like he's like this king and all this kind of stuff. Because yeah. the whole time in the movie, he's presented as this man on the top of the mountain kind of thing, except when his sister is insulted. And then yeah. he, he, he basically becomes a street thug at that point. Yeah. You know? But every time they ever show him, he's always shown clean cut, standing tall above all his servants and all this kind of stuff. And then they play this like this big music for him all the time. Yeah. So, so now that we've got the reveal, he also reveals that Mr. Park is still working for him. For him. Yes. And they get a phone call where Mr. Park or Mido is on the phone and she's crying because there's a big purple box in front of her. And she's afraid of what's inside. Mm -hmm. And Evergreen tells Deso, like, basically, you need to make me feel like I don't need to tell her. You know, and he starts begging him, please don't tell her. Please don't ruin her life. Um, starts acting like a dog and, like, licking his boots and everything. It's, like, super degrading. Yeah, this part was hard for me to watch. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean... It's it's wrong if it's a woman too, but it's really hard as a man to watch another man act like this. Grovel. Yes. Yeah. It's like you just cut your own penis off. That's <laughs> yeah. that's what that's like, you know. It was hard to watch. And I, I hadn't seen this movie in years, but I already still remember when the first day I saw I saw it with my cousin David, who's also a co host of this show. And it was hard to watch then because we saw it in 2006 the first time. Mm -hmm. And it's just he it's just so degrading and demeaning of this man. And he's doing anything to not have his daughter see these pictures and find out that uh, yeah. Desu's his fa our father. I felt like you do when you see those gross out scenes of teeth being pulled out and all this kind of stuff. Well, I say it ends with a pretty gross out scene. Was speaking of, you know, cutting things off, he decides to grab a pair of scissors and cut his own tongue out of his mouth. No anesthesia. <laughs> And hopefully those scissors were sharp, man. Otherwise, that'd be pretty rough. Well, <laughs> so. you could hear it cutting through the flesh. Oh, I know. Oh, my God. It was so bad. <laughs> and they stuck a rag in his mouth to stop the bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> but his apology is finally accepted. Yeah. And he agrees to, to tell, or he tells Mr. Park not to tell her the truth. And so Evergreen's now walking out of the building. And we see flashes of what really happened. And so we see the flashback of him. And this kind of mirrors the opening scene of the of when Desu is holding the tie of the guy. Mm -hmm. She's hanging off the dam and he's holding her hand. Yeah. And she tells him, let me go. Like, I need to like, I need to be I need to go. You have to let me go. And she ends up uh, he can't hold her because he's a scrawny little thing and can't hold on to her. And she ends up falling into the dam. But before she falls, she does say she did not regret the relationship. Yeah. And she takes a picture for him to remember her by, yeah. And that's why I brought up the fact, was it a love story? Because she truly loved him in a sexual way. It's forbidden. But then why does she kill herself, right? Because it's too, it's too, the, the reputation Because of the shame. shame. Too much? Yeah. The shame is much greater than the love was. Yeah. That's the only reason. Had they not been caught, they'd still be banging each other. And you also got to remember, this is um, an Asian culture. So shame is much bigger a deal than it is in American culture. Yeah. So everybody knows that you and your brother are having sex with each other, that she doesn't want to leave her house. She doesn't want to be seen, nothing. Yeah. And what's she going to do? How's she going to get a job or anything like that? She can't go back to school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's all I was saying. The, the feelings are the same. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just saying it's still a love story because the two of them loved each other. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say that uh, he ends up killing Mr. Han. He shoots him in the head, right? Yeah, because what happened was Daesu, uh, when he lost it and tries to attack Evergreen, Mr. Han steps in and starts doing these judo throws with him, right? And then the last one, 
And Mr. On throws Daisu up against this glass window, which starts cracking. But then we see blood coming out of Mr. Han's ear. And it's because Daisu had that pair of scissors and he shoved it into Mr. Han's ear before he hit that window. Yeah. So he's he's already dying at this point, but they're still fighting. And then and then Evergreen is telling him, telling Mr. Han, stop fighting. He can't hear him because he's been punctured in his head through his ear. So Evergreen walks up behind Mr. Han, pulls up his gun, and shoots him in the back of the head and kills him. Yeah. You know. But he was gonna die anyway, because the, the scissors went into his brain. Yeah. So he's he wasn't long for this world. But I forgot that was the setup so that Evergreen has a gun. And so now that he walks into the elevator and he kills himself, because now what else does he have to live for, right? He's gotten his revenge. That was his whole purpose for the rest of his life was to get Daisu and I guess Juwan too. I guess Mido wasn't really a target. She was just a casualty of it. Yeah. But he definitely wanted Daisu and Juwan dead. So that's not the end of the movie. The end of the movie, Daisu decides that he wants to find the hypnotist that was originally used to put post hypnotic suggestions in their head. Oh, I'm sorry. We totally forgot to say that. Yeah. So in in the reveal, when Evergreen is saying what happened, they talk about the the suggestions they made, and this explains a lot of Mido's behavior. Is they also hypnotized her and made suggestions to her so that um, there was a specific phrase he used when he opened the phone and was talking to the person on the phone that that triggered her to touch his hand. And then he was triggered that when she touched his hand to pass out. So they were like doing that hypnotic suggestion to make them have some feelings toward each other. That's why when the sexual assault happens, she just lets it go because the, the suggestion in her head is overriding her common sense, you know? So that's why, because I don't really know too many women who just met a dude would bring them home like that and let them stay. And after they tried to rape them, would yeah, still right. let them stay, you know? Gianna being number one on that list. You know, you try to rape Gianna, it's over. I'm just oh, you're saying. Dead. You're dead. <laughs> you know? There's no coming back. From There's that. no coming back from that one. <laughs> so, um, so that is the explanation of what explains what Mido's behavior was, why she kept com- was compelled to stay with Daisu, even though Daisu is toxic. Yeah. I mean, absolutely toxic. And he brings in a lot of drama into her life that did not exist. Because she actually, they say in the thing, she actually quit her job to stay with him. So she's all in. We missed another thing, too, because that last scene is so chaotic. As Evergreen walks to the elevator, he drops the remote to his pacemaker. And we find out that that was all bullshit because Daisu hits it and all it does is play something on the speakers, which is him and Mido having sex. So we still don't know why his chest was cut open. Yeah, they never say that either. Yeah, because if it didn't, I mean, maybe it was a real pacemaker. Yeah, and he just lied about the remote remote yeah yeah we don't know that it's never revealed because he he goes in the elevator we see the flashback when he what it really happened to his sister he puts his gun to his head and blows his brains out so desu finds this hypnotist and asks if she can just erase the knowledge that mido is his daughter which i don't know how i feel about this dude because this means that he knows it's wrong that's right but he wants to continue it without realizing that it's wrong it's because it would destroy Mido, and he doesn't want to do that. Why can't he just disappear? Like, then what's she supposed to do? It, who cares? Like, she'd go on with her life. She's like 20 years old. Like, <laughs> ew. Like, he chooses to go back into an incestuous relationship. He, he, he does because she's already, her, her mother's dead. She believes her father's dead, or whatever, whatever she believes. And her life is basically been taken care of by, oh, we did, I don't know if we said this, that uh, Evergreen was financially supporting this uh, Mido yeah. her entire life. He secretly raised her to yeah. part of this whole scheme. She never found that out, but he was he he confesses that to Daisu. When I first saw this, I thought he was they were gonna he was gonna have them both hypnotized so they could just forget any of this ever happened. I didn't realize he was just gonna do it to himself. Yeah, but I. I don't know if I would have wrote this. <laughs> I don't know if I would have said, yeah, I just want the, the father and the daughter to live happily ever after. And I guess have a couple kids. Yeah. And, and there you go. I Like I said, too, that's why this came across to me as an extremely dark fairy tale. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because this is how fairy tales end, except you take the incest component out of it. But this is how the 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 knight saves the woman. Because remember, she she got saved a lot in this movie. Knight kills the evil dragon or the evil wizard or whatever, and then the knight and the princess go off into the sunset together. Yeah. But usually they're not blood father and daughter, you know? So I I would not have ended this story this way. I couldn't have done it. And remember, the director specifically wrote this. He changed the ending of the comic book, and this is the ending he wanted. So I guess this is, you could look at it as this is a hopeful ending, that two people who love each other are together. And, and also, I guess, I don't know if this is true. I guess you could say, since he destroyed the relationship between Evergreen and his sister, he's trying to make up for that relationship between him and his daughter. Yeah, I guess so. I'm not saying it's good. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what that's how you could interpret it. Yeah. You know? And see this that's why this is why it's kind of surprises me how well this film did in two thousand and three. Because the once you get the incest reveal and you know how it ends where they walk off together, you know, and they're going to stay together until they die or whatever. It still was a huge hit internationally yeah. and around the globe. They just loved this movie, you know, and I, when I had never seen it, I didn't know that reveal was coming. Remember this before the internet was really the yeah. internet, you know? So I didn't know it until the, the movie, what was going to happen. So, but it was, it was a big hit. A lot of people, and like you said, your friend, he was teaching, they was teaching this, this movie in yeah. classes, Yeah, you know? Um, now I'm assuming they're college because you couldn't really do this in high school. Yeah, like I said, it was a community college. Yeah. And the only reason I suggested this movie is because of how you like Parasite. Yeah. You know, because that had a lot of stuff that you're probably not used to either. You know, so I was, that's why I was pushing that. And even Squid Games to a certain extent, because Squid Games is like, that's another one that sort of has that sort of, uh, I, I think I said in the review of that, it it's more like a uh, Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. Alice in Wonderland on crack kind of thing. It is a surreal world that the Squid Game is in. And that's kind of how I see, if you if we ever do the other parts of the Vengeance tril Trilogy, the Vengeance Trilogy is kind of a surreal world. It's not of the real world. It's a it's an unnatural world. So the events that happen there would not happen in the real world, but the, they can happen there. And so that's what's, the, I think, the attraction to the trilogy. Because it's, it's, it's so unusual what's going on in this thing and nothing the motivation like lady vengeance is sort of like what happens in this movie her she is wrong severely and then she goes on this quest to just burn everybody who burned her and the same thing happens in mr sympathy for mr vengeance that's why they called the whole thing the vengeance trilogy it's all about that they're not connected directly the only thing that connects the three movies is vengeance you do see uh me doe in lady vengeance she plays a completely different character she plays a news reporter Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. But they're not connected in any kind of way as far as characters go. So if we ever watch the other two. Um, but I just was curious how you would look at it because this is a movie that I'm pretty sure you normally would not watch. No. So so let me ask you this, though. The way the movie ends, do you believe that he really was hypnotized? And like, Because the, the way it ends is like he smiles at first and then you see the smile kind of fade. So what like what is your interpretation of that no 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 i think he was you do. okay so okay. just for the audience so the hypnotist basically what she did was she split desu's mind into two parts the monster and then there's desu the monster remembers everything that happened desu does not so she says in your mind you'll see the monster turn around and just walk into the wilderness for every step he takes he ages one year and then finally he'll just fall over and die or disappear or something like that. If Desu remembered anything of what happened, he could not continue. I, I think I know what you're talking about because he does that that smile earlier in the movie too. Yeah. I think the monster is dead. I don't think Desu could even be near his daughter if he remembered any of this. Yeah. That's why I was thinking he really, that, that memory's gone. Now she did warn him that some of these memories could return. Yeah. He, it could get distorted memories. And that would that would really freak me out because there's no context to them. You just be getting these images and you don't know why they're popping in your head. I don't like that at all. But I really do think he does not remember the horror that he went through. Yeah. Because it, it, it would just be, 
I, I know in real the real world there are some guys who could have an ancestral relationship with their children, cousins, whatever. But the majority of the planet could not do that in all good consciousness. They just couldn't do it, you know, especially a father and their daughter. Although in Game of Thrones, you do remember that guy who had like 15 daughters and <laughs> he insisted on getting them all pregnant. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, all his t- grandchildren were, uh, well, what is that? I guess your sons too. Yeah. <laughs> it's sons Man, and daughters I too. I the name of that dude, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess he was in the early season, right? I don't think he made it through the whole the whole yeah, series. Yeah, cuz that's when Sam st- like steals away one of the daughters. That's either. right. He falls yeah. in love with the girl. Jilly. Yeah. Yeah. So, this pushes the boundaries of everything mm-hmm. that that culturally we stand for in this country. And and until I started watching foreign films, and this wasn't my first one. It just happened a friend of mine liked uh, Asian cinema too and he gave it to me. Um, Because this was right after Audition, which is a Japanese film, blew up. Um, I didn't know there were films like this being made because I was always used to American films. I didn't know they did this outside of America. But in the Asian countries, and I guess in the French and some of the Europeans too, they don't have the same sensibilities we do. They don't have the same limitations we do. So they do what they want to do. It's like, I think you told me, oh, I read this, but I think you agreed with it, that there's a reason why until uh, Hunger Games, Battle Royale wasn't made in America, like a, an American Battle Royale. Mm-hmm. And it, they, they said, what I was reading, this is before Hunger Games came out, though. The reason is they did not like the fact that you had an island full of children killing each other. Yeah. And Americans would not react to that well, to see to pay money to see that. And yeah. whether you made it PG-13 or rated R, doesn't make any difference. They don't want to support anything like that because it offends their cultural sensibilities, their moral standings. But in Japan... Battle Royale and internationally, the first one, the second was horrible. The first one was an enormous hit, you know? And because it was a different kind of film. It doesn't matter what the subject matter was. People had never seen nothing like that before. Was it say, you so know? you said this was your first foray into Asian cinema? No, 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 no. I, I'd seen other Asian movies before this. I had okay. never seen no story like this before. Okay. Um, because remember, say, Audition came out in 99. Yeah, the very first real... Battle Royale was like the first time I'd seen any type of Asian cinema. That was 2000. I was a friends with a lot of nerds in high school. So, yeah. uh, the, you know, someone had a, a DVD leg, D, or no, D, not DVD back then. Oh, VHS, <laughs> a VHS tape. tape. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I actually have it on VHS too, because I liked the movie so much that I ordered it like off eBay or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but the, that's, what's crazy too, is the difference between a movie like that in Japan and a movie like that here is the level of violence they actually show on screen, right? Right. Like when you watch Battle Royale, those kids are getting blown up on screen. Like and it's kids. It happen. It's kids. Right. And yeah, Hunger Games is kids too, but none of the deaths are like, you don't see graphic deaths of teenagers on television. Well, what about the books though? Do they do it graphically in there or no? Uh, no. I mean, they obviously describe the deaths, right? Because they kind of have to but yeah i don't remember it ever being it's been years since i read it but i don't remember it being graphic because that's not a mature series right no it's young adult oh okay then they wouldn't yeah. do that then okay yeah yeah See, I, I don't know what those i've never read those books but i know the movies are pg-13 there wasn't any rated r one but i also wonder like it's, it's kind of funny to debate this as well but uh like you know hunger games had to also be set in like a dystopian society right where mm-hmm. in battle royale it wasn't supposed to be too far in the future no and and the reason was overpopulation and kids being out of control right so they would just randomly pick a class of a certain grade level and make them all kill each other mm-hmm. so, and, and and that's what i'm saying it amazes me that film and, and that's just not that's just that live action film they do this in their anime uh the mm-hmm. japanese and the koreans uh in their anime stories too and like i said in america even the cartoons, because in America, cartoons are seen as for children. Yeah. So you're not going to have a lot of the violent stuff. I remember when Batman the Animated Series was considered extremely violent for American television audiences. And they're mainly talking about children. And it, there wasn't even any blood. It was just a lot of fighting. But they considered that too violent. Now imagine if we had Battle Royale coming out. <laughs> and they would have said that would have... That would have indoctrinated the children into violence and perversion and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But I, I just, for me personally, and I don't know how you were when you were younger, I just wanted different kinds of stories than what I was normally getting. And that's why I sought out a lot of the, 
Well, first it started with manga when I was um, in high school. And then I started uh, seeing anime because we started getting a lot of it when Akira blew up here. And so I just wanted a different sign of storytelling that pushed the boundaries. And it, it wasn't because I needed to see titties and stuff like that. I just wanted a storytelling that was serious, but they did it in animated form. And I wanted to see... The thing about American TV is it's very formulaic, especially back in the 80s and 90s. Oh, yeah. It's really, really formulaic. And I guess a lot of Americans don't mind it, but it drives me crazy. That's why I don't watch a lot of TV because a lot of it just bores the shit out of me. Yeah, it's like sitcom y, right? So it's yeah. like that, like you said, it's that multicam, like kind of repeating situations, campiness. Like, yeah. It's just, yeah. It's not, and that's why I think if you've noticed, those have kind of gone away. Like yeah, people don't watch those anymore because it's so formulaic, I think. Right. People and, are searching, and- everyone's searching for stories, better stories. Well, I think Sopranos really blew the door on that one because it just, yeah. when that came out, HBO started doing more of that kind of content mm-hmm. and then other networks started copying. Even then, even the broadcast networks try, but they can only go so far because they're broadcast. Yeah. But people started wanting deeper, more unconventional storytelling. And I, I've been saying this since I was a kid that we should have got this, but everybody yeah. liked that formulaic nonsense, you know? Because then back when I was coming up, the better stories were told in movies instead of TV. Yeah. And now it's done in TV now instead of the movies. So that well, it was yeah, unheard of. What's nice is they finally figured that out, right? That you could actually tell a whole story over like 10 episodes or eight episodes, right? Or even yeah. four episodes. But you can get, or especially when adapting books. I mean, how many books did we see adapted that were so shitty? <laughs> that made it into a 90 minute or a two hour movie. I know. Right? I, I know. mean, I mean, and Lord of the Rings is the ones that really broke that mold, right? When they made like a three and a half hour movie or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, oh, one went four with the uncut stuff. Yeah. But like yeah. some people don't want to sit there for a whole. <laughs> I always laugh because there's a tweet I saw that was like, someone goes, three and a half hour movie? Nah. Oh, wait. Netflix, 10 hours binging of a show? Yeah, absolutely. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the way we're trained to uh, ingest content, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll binge 10 episodes, but a three hour movie feels like more of a time commitment, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like it just feels, it feels different. Did you watch Schindler's List when it came out? I don't think so. Okay. It's a hard movie to watch, especially if you're not a history buff, but that was, I think like three hours and it's three brutal hours. I mean, there is some, there is some lighter moments in it, but there is a lot of just realistic killing of those internment uh, uh, prisoners. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I mean, it's unrelenting watching that. And they put it on TV, which amazed me. I'm sure they edited the hell out of it. But yeah. uh, they did put it on TV, I think, about seven, eight years ago. I like that kind of stuff where we see that kind of pushing your boundary stuff. But I, I like I said, a lot of people like comfort zone stuff. They like to know what they're going to get. And a lot of people still believe in that that model. Because in in the 50s, Hollywood had to take a lot more orders from the government. And they had told them that when you make stories, you have to make sure the bad guy goes to jail or goes to prison. Yeah, We can't, because they, the reason was because they didn't want children to see, uh, like Sopranos. They didn't want Sopranos back in the 50s, 40s, 30s. They didn't want a successful criminal making a living defying the law. They didn't want that. That's why all the gangster movies ended with the guy going to prison or jail or dying horribly or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. But the world's changed now. And, the, and a lot of people are like me, where they're like, you know, in the real world, there are a lot of bad people who make a lot of money and live very well and never go to jail and live a long life. Yeah. So why can't we have stories about them? I was, I was, there was one thing I was reading though, what, and this was a female viewer. She had said, you know, can we go back to the days where people were just bad and we didn't have to feel sympathetic for the bad guy? <laughs> they were just bad because they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> And it it's true. It, it, everybody wants to make the, the villain more sympathetic now, I, yeah. obviously, because it makes the, the story deeper. But there are people who miss the days when they could just hate a person and they wouldn't find out about the guy's childhood yeah. or he saved a bunch of people. None of that. They just want them bad to be bad. Yeah. But a lot of artistic people don't want to. To them, that's boring. They want to show more light. Uh, that there's more to this person than he's just the, the the guy with the mustache twirling. You didn't watch the Punisher series, right? No. Okay. Can you root for 
Did you watch any of the serial st- killer stuff like uh, Dexter and all that stuff? I mean, I did. Well, yes. And I did watch the Punisher movie. So I am familiar with the story of the Punisher. OK, so, you know, he goes around killing drug dealers and stuff yeah, like that. There's no trial. Story, he just right? yeah, yeah, he just kills them. Yeah. Uh, however, he will not kill cops. He has a, a rule about that. He won't touch cops and he tries. He doesn't want to kill any innocent people, mm-hmm. but he does. There's no trial to what he does. He just. He deems you bad and he shoots you yeah. and kills you. And so you're basically trusting him saying this guy's back because I say he's bad. Yeah. You know, you don't have the facts of unless they show it to you, but you don't know the people he's killing, you know, if they got 15 kids or they help out their people or whatever. Yeah. You just see the drug deal that goes down and all that kind of stuff. So I, that's why I've always said that whole rooting for things I don't do. I, I root for the story. I don't generally root for a character. Yeah. And 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 what I've noticed, especially with American on, this happened to uh, Walking Dead. Every time they kill off one of the main cast, they lose audience. I know. I hate that too because I was like, okay, so we know that certain people are safe. Yeah. That these like like Daryl in The Walking Dead will never die no. because he's such a fan favorite that people would be too pissed off. That's right. But it's like that's what. That's what stories of cinema is supposed to make you feel. It's supposed to make you feel upset. It's supposed to make you feel emotions. Yeah. Like it kind of ruins to me. I mean, that's part of why I stopped watching it is it kind of ruined the series for me when they basically said that like Daryl would never die. So Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, so what other choices are they making to support the audience and not the story? Well, at that point, uh, when you were watching it, they would never kill off Rick either. Yeah. Daryl and Rick were untouchable unless Rick decided, and that's what he did. He decided to leave. But had he not decided to leave, they would have never killed him. But man, when they killed, uh, spoiler alert, Beth, that was intense, man. That was a tough (laughs) one. And I thought that was an excellent choice to do that, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that's how you tell stories. You make them more true to life of what's actually, what could actually happen. Yeah. Instead of making it like, oh, let's protect this person because the fans love them. You know? Well, yeah, and that's how not, I mean, before the 2000s, that's how main shows were done, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I I don't know. I, I was a huge X-Files fan, and they did eventually replace the two X-Files stars because they didn't want to do the show anymore, Yeah, you know? But I, to me, like I said, part of watching the show is the fact that you don't know who's going to die. Now, granted, there might be one guy who you know you can't touch. Like in Breaking Bad, you can't kill what's his name? Uh, Brian Cranston's character. Yeah, Walt, because then the show's over. Yeah, but everybody else should be fair game. Yeah. Everybody else, I don't care who it is, everybody else should be fair game. The world revolves around that guy. So uh, just like with Tony Soprano, you can't really kill Tony Soprano off in the show in season one, you know? But yeah, then, but not necessarily. Look at Ned Stark getting killed in the beginning. I was just like, about to bring yeah, that up. I mean, it can happen in a way that really elevates the story. But was you know? that Ned Stark, and I haven't seen season one in a long time. Was that Ned Stark show in season one? But okay, maybe at least in the book, you build it builds up Ned as the main character of the book. Okay. So when he gets killed, it is devastating for the reader because you're like, wait. You just you just made this person my focus, like their whole family. <laughs> like he, so it's like the Stark family yeah. is the focus of the book, and he is the leader of the Stark family. He's the father, yeah. and then boom, dead. And you're just like, what the fuck just happened? And it's just such a good. Oh, oh so in the like, book, it was a surprise to you when he. Oh died. yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh, I, read, I didn't I read, know that. Okay, I, I thought the they just did that for the the show. No, I yeah. When I read the book in like 2000, man, that is like it blows you away. I think that's part of. I know you always ask me why I love those books so much, and I think maybe that was part of it. Is at that time in my life, I had never read a story like that before. Yeah. Where it just completely like. Like, again, three quarters of the book builds up that this is the guy that you're following, and then he's dead. And you're mm. just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, what what happens now? <laughs> yeah, I, did, so, I didn't know that. And that's just, and he's dead by book one? He doesn't make it to the second book? Oh, no, he doesn't make it to the second book. See, just so you know, season one and book one are almost right on the money. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. they obviously, like, cut some characters and change some characters and, like, you know, like it's all supporting stuff. Yeah. But for the majority of the story arc, um, it follows season one and book one are the closest. 
Interesting. So, I did not know yeah. that. I mean, I yeah. have the books. I just haven't listened to them yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always wondered with with you. I didn't know if you liked George R. R. Martin because I didn't know if it was like a dialogue thing. Like, what was your obsession with them? Or because this, I've noticed this on Twitter. His fan base, despite the fact that half of them can't stand him because Wins a Winner ain't out yet, that they, they love his stories. And I'm I, and I haven't listened to it yet. But is it because of the dialogue? Or is it because of, oh, because you're not a fantasy fan. So I don't know what it is that attracts you to the story. To be honest, I've never even read his other stuff outside of Game of Thrones. So I don't even know. um, So all you know is his his fantasy stuff. Yeah. Okay. But to be fair, like, I wouldn't say that I'm not a sci-fi fan because Ender's Game is one of my favorite books as well. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I just a joy like as you know like the ones that are a little more com like social commentary or like a little more outside the box of storytelling yeah like i think you well it might be a little dated for you but uh robert highland was into that he did a lot of the guy your star Trek troopers guy he oh, um yeah. he was big into i think those commentaries in every single thing he did you know he just knew that he he liked doing science fiction but his social uh political views is what this is the reason why he enjoyed writing those stories. Well, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, Starship Troopers is a prime example. Like, it's a campy, ridiculous movie unless you look at the deeper social commentary, right? Yeah. And again, that's why you, I think you always give me shit for liking that movie, too. But I think that's a, fu- it's a fun movie that is actually really deep when you think about the message, you know? Well, that's why I was a little worried about this film, Old Boy, because the reason you really like Parasite is because of the commentary. Yeah. Yeah, and this doesn't really have a lot of social commentary. I mean, no, it's just a straight up revenge movie. But yeah. you know what? Like, call it like John Wick. You know, that's a straight up revenge movie. I don't know if you've even seen those. The second one I saw um, on a plane. You know, the first one, the dog gets killed. That's what sets off a series of events. Just letting you know. <laughs> I know. I just don't. You dog people, I don't understand this. I just. I just... <laughs> All right, y'all. This is the end of the episode. Appreciate all of y'all listening to the show. Until next time, goddammit.